So I was thinking about how clinical would be now with the coronavirus, and it made me think of how some students are in clinical. Here's some pictures. So hepatitis literally means inflammation of the liver. Hepa is liver, itis is inflammation. And this is usually caused by viruses, hepatitis A, B, and C, alcohol, and acetaminophen. The main thing you need to understand with hepatitis is the three different types of viruses that cause it. Hepatitis A, it's transmitted through the fecal oral route. This means through contaminated food and water. And what is the food and water contaminated with? It's poop. Poop that has the hepatitis A virus. If this is transmitted through food and water, then the best way to prevent it is through hand hygiene. The other way is through vaccination. And who should we vaccinate? Anyone that handles food. Like the lunch lady, anyone working at restaurants, your favorite fast food place because they definitely wash their hands. Now if you already have hepatitis A, then you're going to have to get post-exposure prophylaxis. This means get vaccinated or receive something called immune globulin, which just means receiving the antibodies. And if you're having a hard time remembering that hep A is through the fecal oral route, just remember this. If it ends in a vowel, it comes from the bowels. All right, so the last thing is if the patient received the vaccine for hep A, then the family has to receive it as well. You also want to teach the family not to share anything. Don't share any utensils, don't share the bathroom because they can contaminate each other. Alright, so now we're moving on to hepatitis B. Hep B is transmitted through blood and sex. That's what the B is for, blood and sex. You want to teach the patients to use condoms and clean needles, alright? I always tell students, don't be silly, wrap your willy. So make sure you teach your patients about safe sex and clean needle programs. We want to vaccinate anyone who's at risk for blood and sex. So healthcare workers are at risk for needle stick injuries, sex workers, IV drug users, and newborn babies. If you've been already exposed to hepatitis B and you haven't had the vaccine, then you need to get post-exposure prophylaxis. And this involves either getting vaccinated or receiving the antibodies, immune globulin. You also want to make sure you clean any blood with bleach because bleach is the only thing that's gonna kill the hepatitis B vaccine. Make sure you dilute the bleach with one part bleach, 10 parts water. So the last hepatitis is called hepatitis C, and this is transferred through percutaneous, so IV drug users. Hepatitis C is one of the hepatitises that often goes chronic, meaning the patient keeps it inside of their body for 20, 30 more years than that. You want to make sure you teach the patient to use condoms and clean needles, just like in Hep B. There is no vaccine available for Hep C, but there is treatment, but it's really expensive and doesn't really work that well. People at risk are going to be baby boomers who were born from 1945 to 1965, and I tried my very best to find out why. Why in the world are baby boomers at risk for Hep C? I looked in your Lewis book, it didn't say. I looked at the CDC, they don't know. I looked into research, they don't know. I made my own conclusion, Woodstock. But seriously, we still don't know why baby boomers are at risk for hep C. All right, so now hep D. The only thing you need to know about hep D is you need hep B to get hep D. The only thing you need to know for hep E is that you usually have hep A when you get hep E. All right, moving on. All right, so the signs and symptoms of hepatitis are in phases or stages. The first one is gonna be the preecteric stage. And this is when the patient has flu-like symptoms. They're really vague. The patient has fatigue, muscle aches, headaches, nausea, vomiting, anorexia. And then we move on to the icteric phase. This is when the patient starts turning jaundice. So let me explain why. Now, jaundice means the patient starts turning yellow. This is because there's an increase in bilirubin. If you remember from AMP, your red blood cells are eventually broken down after they get too old. And one of the byproducts of this is going to be your heme and your globin from your hemoglobin. The heme gets turned into the bilirubin, which then turns into the bilirubin. Now, how your body gets rid of bilirubin is through the liver. 
The liver will conjugate bilirubin, which means it's a fancy way of saying it will make it complete. Then the conjugated bilirubin will be secreted into the bile, which gets stored in the gallbladder and then released into the small intestine every time you eat. Then the conjugated bilirubin ends up in your large intestine and turns your poop brown. In the case with hepatitis, your liver is messed up and can't get rid of the bilirubin. So the bilirubin levels go up, which is what causes the yellowing. If you didn't understand any of that, that's okay. Just know that jaundice is caused by high bilirubin levels because the liver is too messed up to get rid of it. So from a clinical standpoint, if you ever wonder if your patient has jaundice, you want to check the nail bed, the sclera of their eyes, which is the white part, and their skin. The other symptoms that can happen because of the jaundice are clay-colored stools, because you don't have that conjugated bilirubin to turn your stools brown, steatorrhea, which is a fancy way of saying fatty, floaty poop, dark urine, and pruritus, because the bilirubin goes to the skin and causes itchiness. All right, so we're finally moving to the post-dicteric phase, and this is when the patient turns back to normal and the sign and symptoms go away. So there's two complications to hepatitis. The first one is called cirrhosis which just means really messed up liver. And then the next one's liver cancer. Both of these, you're gonna to have to do a liver biopsy, which we'll talk about in a bit. So the diagnostics for hepatitis, the first one is gonna be something called LFTs. This is a blood draw. It stands for liver function test. We're checking two things, ALT and AST. If these two labs are elevated, it means there's damage done to the liver. The next thing we can check is bilirubin levels and the hepatitis virus antigens. All right, so now we're gonna talk about liver biopsy. Remember I said this can be used for liver cancer or cirrhosis? Well, liver biopsy is basically taking a piece of the liver out to check it. The first thing you need to do before a liver biopsy is check to see if the patient's coagulating good enough so they don't bleed out. Then you wanna make sure that the informed consent is in the chart and the patient understands what they're gonna get and make sure the patient is NPO. During the procedure, you want to position the patient with their right arm up on the bed. This is to allow access to the liver. You want to tell the patient to exhale and hold their breath for 10 seconds while the needle is being inserted, and then breathe once the needle is removed. After the procedure, you want to make sure the patient is side-lying. This is to put pressure on the site and prevent it from bleeding. You also want to make sure you monitor for bleeding, so check under them and check for an elevation in pulse, and a decrease in blood pressure. Remember, the first sign of bleeding is tachycardia, then hypotension. So the treatment involves stopping the patient from worsening their hepatitis. So you want to teach them no alcohol, no acetaminophen, even if the jaundice has gone away already. That doesn't mean their liver is okay. You want to make sure you use standard precautions for all the hepatitis. That means gloves when in contact with body fluids. There is no need for contact, droplet, or airborne precautions for hepatitis. The medical interventions for hepatitis involve antiretrovirals, such as tenofovir, adifovir, lamivudine, and telibuvudine. Look how they all end in VIR for virus or DINE. All right, guys, that's everything you need for hepatitis.